again? Thank you. Okay, next up we have a madman who has attempted to build his own race car using open source tools. So please welcome Dave, the madman. Yeah. Afternoon everyone. Uh, welcome to your Friday afternoon fun talk. Uh, I'm normally here talking about things I do for work, but this time in the uh, program committee in their infinite wisdom, uh, I'm here to talk about my hobbies. Uh, so, I'm here to talk about designing a race car, which I'm currently doing, and trying to use open source tools to do it. Um, when I talk to anyone who knows about this, uh, the first question I get is, am I mad? Uh, because apparently some people have tried to do this before, and um, various levels of success have been had. Um, so. The next question is always, uh, what type of car am I building? And I turn around and say, I'm building a low-cost clubman, which means the very next question is, what is a low-cost clubman? Well, you all saw the image at the start um, on the first page. That's a low-cost clubman. Um, what, we, what it is is basically a simple car. Um, it's based around the design of a Lotus 7. Um, for those of you who know, the Lotus 7 was released in 1957, um, and it was designed by a guy of the name Colin Chapman. He described the Lotus 7 as this. It was a schoolboy car. And what he produced was this. My car doesn't quite look like that. Uh, it's not as swish and as flash and as, as cool as that, but uh, mine go fast instead. So a little bit of brief history for you. In the 1950s, uh, it had a 40 horsepower Ford four-cylinder engine, 1300cc uh, if I remember correctly. It did 0 to 100 in 16 odd seconds, it had a top speed of about 140k an hour. Um, by modern standards, that's not fast, but we're talking about the middle of the 1950s. Uh, so it was actually quite fast at the time. Uh, it was first raced in 1958 by an Englishman by the name of Graham Hill, and that's notable in that in 1968, Graham Hill won an F1 World Championship in a car designed by Colin Chapman. That was another Lotus. So those names keep coming up again and again in the history of Lotus uh, race cars and Formula One. Um, anyway, uh, moving on, there was the Series 2, which had a little bit more power and looked basically exactly the same, and then the Series 3, which was, again, more power and a few minor updates. Um, but then Lotus decided they weren't going to produce it anymore. They had more important things to do, like uh, win F1 World Championships. Uh, and so they handed over the rights for production of the Lotus 7 to Caterham. Now, you may know the Caterham name from, once again, Formula One, and also from the Caterham 7. Uh, Caterham 7 uh, was essentially the Lotus 7 Series 4. Uh, and that was first published in 1974, or not published, first released. Uh, and so over the years, Caterham produced many different versions of the Seven. Uh, as always, uh, it got faster, it got more modern, uh, and it kept getting updated. Uh, in the 80s and early 90s, there were several other English manufacturers that made Lotus 7 uh, clones. So it wasn't just Caterham, um, but they were all independent designs. Uh, they all had their similarities in design and whatnot. Um, but also, a lot of people started building their own versions in the garages. And as part of that movement uh, and the people that were starting to do that, um, Haynes, the company that produces all of your manuals for uh, maintaining your car, your Toyota Corolla, your Holden Commodore and so on, you see them in, you know, everywhere in bookstores and so on, they actually produced a, a published a manual written by an Englishman by the name of Ron Champion, which was build your own sports car for as little as 250 pounds. 
Um, so it wasn't how to pull your car apart and put it back together, it was how to build your car from the ground up from bits you found in the scrapyard and whatnot. Um, if you wanted to make it for 250 pounds, then literally everything had to come from the scrapyard, including all the metal. Um, that book had full schematics and diagrams and so on and such, you know, this is the space frame chassis. Uh, it was all almost 1950s draftsman technology uh, inside the book, so it kind of matched the, uh, the, uh, the history of the, 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 the design. Um, but once it had been published, there was then a public record of a design for building these cars, and they became more popular, and people started building the uh, Haynes Roadster, as it was called. Um, and they're starting to find problems. There are a few mistakes in the book and whatnot, and so there were communities that started to build up around actually building these cars. Um, and not just communities, but there are also low volume manufacturers who each had their own take on the book design. Um, some of those modifications, the derivatives were published um, either by the low volume manufacturers or by the communities themselves so that people didn't have to keep reinventing the wheel. Uh, for example, McSorley was one of the, the companies that produced low volumes uh, they had a, a 442 modification, which is still popular these days because it takes the book chassis and adds four inches in length, four inches in width, and two inches in height because modern, modern human is larger than the human of the 1950s. And so you need that extra space to be able to fit into it. Um, the Aussie mods. Uh, in Australia, we actually have rules about how stiff chassis have to be and how strong the car needs to be. Torsional stiffness is important. Um, and so to get one of the book chassis through uh, the registration process, you need a specific set of modifications to the chassis to make it strong enough to pass those tests. And they're now known in the communities as the Aussie mods. So if you go searching for a Clubman and Aussie mods, you get a page where there's all these diagrams that you put pieces of metal into the chassis in the right place. Um, and over time, uh, there was a lot of stress and strength analysis and improvements suggested for these chassis and published. Uh, students did PhD studies, uh, people who were just interested in the cars and wanted to work out how to make them stiffer and therefore better as race cars um, worked out what they could do to make them stiffer. Um, but overall, these were all mostly based on a, the, the book chassis. There's not a lot of deviation from them. Um, so if I go back to why I have a, uh, a, a low-cost Clubman, I'll give you an example of what my car, my X car, as you'll soon find out, um, was actually capable of doing. So let's see if this works. Okay, oh, we don't have sound, so bear with me. This is uh, from Wakefield Park, which is a circuit just near Canberra. Um, oh, that's a V8 supercar, so that'll give you an idea of the speed that this thing goes at. Um, so this car, with me in it, weighs about 830 kilos. That's a full tank of fuel as well. Um, it has 410 horsepower at the rear wheels. Um, this is a 900 metre long straight and I hit about 205 kilometres an hour at the end of it before having to stop and go round corners. Uh, it's capable of pulling about 1.4 or 1.5 Gs in the corners um, and it can slow down from about 180 k an hour to 60 k an hour in less than 75 metres. Um, this isn't one of the fastest clubmans in the country but it's close to it. Um, but it had significant problems. I could never really tune the suspension properly and whatnot. So this corner here, 150 odd k an hour down to, down to well, 70 in about 30 meters. Um, so this is just a typical lap. Um, I made lots of mistakes in this map. So if you want to critique my driving, come see me afterwards, so I'm happy. Uh, 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 patches don't really work when you, you know, to fix your driving. Um, more practice, if you want to fund laps, that will be fine. Uh, but yes, yeah, so this was about a, a, a 64 second lap around the, the, the track. Um, and so that will give you an idea of the sorts of things that I do with the, the car. Um, 
So why am I where I am? So two weeks after that video was taken, or was it two or maybe three weeks, this happened. I ran out of talent. <laughs> At about 160k an hour, I'd just changed gears in a straight line. Uh, the car broke into wheel spin, pointed me to the left and straight at a concrete wall. The rest is history. The good side is I made some coffee table art. The only thing holding that wheel together is the tire. It's completely broken, it's in three pieces. Uh, the brake disc is shattered. Uh, there's nothing that's actually not broken in that picture. <laughs> it kind of happens when you hit concrete uh, at high speed. I should note that I walked away from the accident. I had slightly bruised ribs, but that was about it. Um, you know, I was more annoyed at the fact that it was the first run of the day and I'd lost a day of running around on the racetrack. Um, anyway, uh, when I got it back home and I stripped everything down, back down to the bare chassis, um, you can see it sitting on the table there and there's quite a twist across the front of it. Well, that's not the worst of it. I couldn't find a 90 degree angle anywhere in the chassis. <laughs> the, rear of the, the rear wheel hit the wall as well, so there were bends in the back of it and crack welds and so on. So if I wanted to repair it, um, I'd have to chop the front off, chop the back off, and then I found that the floor was bent as well, so I'd have to throw that away. <laughs> Nothing left. So here I am talking about designing a new race car chassis. Uh, a few things that I need to, to design, uh, the chassis itself, how the suspension is going to mount, uh, how the engine gearbox and diff all mount into it, um, the lesser realised things such as the safety devices. Uh, CAMS requires certain materials to be used for the roll cage. Uh, they require certain designs for the roll cage to be used. Um, we'll need side intrusion. Um, I'll need to set up the, you have to set the seat belts up specifically for a head and neck restraint device. Um, there'll probably end up being carbon Kevlar impact panels in it and things like that just so that I'm no longer scared about having an accident which I wasn't until. <laughs> and of course, there's body work to be done as well, but you know, that's, that's all at the end. So what tools do I need for this? Uh, of course, I'm gonna need a 3D CAD tool. Uh, for chassis design, I'm gonna need to do stress and strength analysis. Uh, I need to be able to do geometry modeling for the suspension to make sure I get that right. Um, Aerodynamic modelling needs to be done so that I don't end up with a car that lifts the front wheels at 250 kilometres an hour and just goes left or right as it sees fit. Um, and I also need to get uh, a new CNC controller for my little mill so I can make some of the parts that I need, uh, like bell cranks for the pushrod suspension and things like that. So let's look at 3D CAD. Um, I first, first thing, oh, 3D uh, Blender, yeah, that'll do. Um, it's completely incomprehensible to mere mortals. Um, I couldn't make head or tail of it. Uh, QCAD has 3D capability, but then I realized that it's no longer open source software. LibreCAD was forked from QCAD before it got the 3D capabilities. Okay. Uh, open Cascade, I knew about that because it's the back end library for many of the other CAD programs, uh, but it has, an, it has a rudimentary uh, user interface, probably just for testing. Uh, OpenSCAD is the complete opposite. Uh, it's a programmatic interface to the Open Cascade libraries, and there is no front end interface. Uh, so, if you uh, want to use a mouse to design something, forget about it, you've got to write code. Um, I'm not that good at this to begin with, so I needed something that was somewhere in between. At which point uh, I found FreeCAD. Um, it had a workbench interface that was much similar to the tools that I recognised, uh, the professional uh, engineering tools like uh, Autodesk, um, uh, uh, SolidWorks and so on, the ones that are typically used for this sort of, of work. It had lots of features, it seemed to be able to do lots of things, um, but it was also scriptable by Python, mostly written in Python. Um, except for some of the core functionality that's been written in C. Um, but what sold me on it is that it actually had a finite element, 
element analysis workbench built into it. So I thought, right, it's got everything I need, I'll go and use that. Which kind of seemed all good. Um, but you know, there were many issues that I came across in doing this. Uh, some of the features that I sort of wanted to use only worked on simple examples. Um, you know, having pipes automatically join in a tube frame structure is something that's kind of nice to have. Um, it had a fu function for that. It worked just fine when you had two pipes, uh, but the algorithm it used was n squared complexity, uh, and so when you had 50 or 60 joins in the model, uh, it would take a couple of minutes just to add another join. Um, I've got models that have got several hundred joins in them. Um, so those sorts of things just couldn't be used. Um, the object model being exposed directly to users. Uh, the back end library has different types of objects. Um, you know, you might make a box, uh, and if you make a box with one particular method, you end up with an object that is a shape. That's great. You make a box with a different method and you might end up with an object that is a shell. Or it might be a compound solid, or it might be a solid. Uh, and that's all okay as long as you don't need to then join that object to something else. Because if the objects that you're trying to join don't have the same object type, it just fails, it won't do it. And so the object model, if you don't know what process you're going through uh, and what objects that that ends up with, you end up with parts that you can't actually merge and join and interact together in the actual GUI. Um, and that's something that happens all over the place. Um, I had a lot of problems with that. I still have problems with that because some of the functions that you use, the object type that it returns is dependent on the object type of the inputs. And so you change the input object type and you get a different object type out. Um, and when you then fuse that with a different object, it gets very complex very quickly. And there are other little things like it crashed all over the place and, and so on, but it's open source software, that's okay. <laughs> so anyway, after lots of stuffing around, I actually re I made a model of the original chassis, um, the one that I crashed. I measured it all up and I went and walked through the process of making this as a Python script. So that is just a Python script. Um, if I need to rebuild it, uh, I just run the Python script again, it just erases everything and rebuilds it from scratch. It takes about 30 seconds to calculate it. Uh, but I did that to learn how to put this sort of thing together. The first design iteration of the actual chassis itself is somewhat different. There are some aspects of it that are the same, but you can see that there's round tube in there rather than square tube, and a lot of the tube is actually a lot thicker. Um, the, that's because of things like the CAMS regulations for roll cages uh, and whatnot. The green box that you see there, uh, that's the outline of where the engine would be. So I knew that the engine bay would be big enough to fit the engine in it. Um, so there's little things like that that I added that aren't actually part of the analysis and design. But what happens when you have a large project? Yes, yes, absolutely. I decided that the gearbox that I had wasn't sufficient, so I needed to spend lots of money on a shiny new one. And because I couldn't find the right one that would fit, I also then needed a shiny new differential, which is what you see in the photo there. And because I had a shiny new differential, I then had to redesign the rear end of the uh, chassis to actually fit that. And because I had now redesigned it and need custom parts, I had to work out how to get those custom parts fabricated. Uh, and that came to getting stuff laser cut. So how did I get this model from the 3D CAD program to the actual pieces of metal you can see mounted on the diff there? Uh, it was interesting. Um, I'd been struggling to find information with FreeCAD, and a week before I had to do this, uh, one of the FreeCAD developers actually released a new manual. Uh, and it wasn't your typical press this button to do this, press this button to do this, press this button to do this. There were six or seven chapters, and each of them walked through a different aspect of creating something. Uh, one of the chapters was basically an architectural model of a house. 
Um, another one was creating, I think, a, like a piston. Um, so, so all the, you know, 3D modeling or architectural modeling or whatnot. And one of the chapters had happened to be, how do you take a model and put it in a format that your average, uh, I wouldn't say average, um, that your fabricator would understand and be able to make. So like 2D drawings for your 3D equipment, you know, what the templates they're going to use and so on. And so that was how to take a model like that and drop it in and output DXF drawings, which of course, anyone that's making you know, laser cutter, water cutter and so on, they take DXF files as the uh, image. So, problem solved. Uh, three weeks later, I had this lovely pieces of metal ending up on my doorstep and they fit just perfectly. You know, half millimeter tolerance and no problems at all. Uh, I was actually quite surprised. The first thing that I got laser cut fit. But like I said, getting that done, I had to change the chassis a bit. Um, you can see that the, the, the rear of the chassis is now completely different and the roll cage is different. It's now actually a fully compliant six point cams roll cage uh, that I can actually make to full FIA spec. Um, so international specifications. Um, so much stronger. And not only that, there's seven kilograms less metal in the rear end of it because I simplified everything at the same time. So buying a new differential meant that the car is actually better. Um, I had to spend more time on it. And part of that was the finite element analysis I had to do. That's how I optimised the chassis and worked out whether it was stronger or not. Um, that's an older model, um, but the process essentially is that you fuse all your model parts together so they're one piece. Uh, you then generate a mesh of that. Uh, once you've got the mesh back, you then define the points that are fixed in space, those that have forces on them, and what material it's made out of. Uh, you can then run a calculation and you get back a mesh with deformations and whatnot, and you can visualize the results. Um, it all sounds very simple, but uh, there are issues. First of all, FreeCAD had no mesh generator, so What's the point of having a finite element analysis module if you can't even take the first step? Well, someone had written macros to execute an external meshing program that came along in, you know, yonks ago um, and is used widely in research institutes and so on. But unfortunately, Gmesh uh, had a habit on my models of going crash, -y crash, 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 hang. Um, and while it was doing this, uh, FreeCAD was completely unresponsive. So it might take five minutes before it hangs or crashes or whatnot, and so I can't do anything while it's doing that. Um, there were problems with uh, cylindrical uh, complexity. Uh, if the roll cage was made out of shells, then it just didn't mesh them properly. Uh, so of course, what's the next thing you do? You make the roll cage pipes as solids and it meshes just fine except then FreeCAD wouldn't pass the solids correctly to the calculation program, and so that wouldn't work. Um, so I had to come up with a bunch of different workarounds. Um, I ended up building FreeCAD and GMesh from the dev trees. Um, building FreeCAD from the dev tree fixed all the crashes that I was having and introduced a whole new set. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I built a second model using only rec rectangular tube to get around the problems of the cylindrical tube. Um, I had to restrict the mesh complexity to stop it from disappearing into an endless recursive hole, making the mesh finer and finer and finer and finer until it split the atom. Um, but generally it took me lots and lots of effort before I started to get consistent results. Once I had a process that gave me consistent results, then it was actually quite reliable, but it took a long, way to, long time to get there. Um, so just to give an example of the results, um, you know, if I have time at the end, I'll show you uh, 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 the actual visualization of the results that you get, um, but I'll do that if I've got time. Uh, the book chassis, 1300 Newton meters degree, that's widely seen on the net and various people who have done you know, element analysis of them have come with that. The original chassis, 
was about that. Um, when I had the engine out to be rebuilt, I welded some more metal into it, made it a bit stiffer. Um, so instead of being uh, as strong as a wet noodle, it was as strong as a you know, semi-dry noodle. Um, but the new chassis, uh, that's up there around where you'd want a race car to start, you know, 15,000 newton meters degree. Uh, um, a typical family car is probably somewhere between six to 7,000 newton meters degree in terms of stiffness. Um, a supercar can be anywhere between, you know, 15,000 for the ones that have got aluminium bodies to 27, 28,000 for carbon fiber body. Um, so that'll give you an idea of what the relative strengths are there. Of course, you've got to validate your model in some way that it's actually telling you real things. Uh, and so I did that by making one-tenth scale wireframe models out of welding wire. I used welding wire because it's copper coated and that means it's easy to solder. It's hard to weld welding wire to welding wire. <laughs> <laughs> It sort of works, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I then put it on uh, essentially a three-post torsion rig on, on my desktop, um, you know, more welding wire, and then some weights that were out of the inside of a hard disk that I disassembled. I needed the magnets. But anyway, so basically what I ended up with was that the new chassis could hold about five to six times the amount of weight of the old chassis. Um, if I put any more weight on the old chassis, then it broke solder joints. Um, if I put any more weight on the, uh, on the new chassis, then it just ripped the sticky tape off the desk. Um, so definitely much, much stronger. So I basically knew that what I was going to be building was much stronger and a very good base to start from. But to actually finalize the design, I needed to make sure I knew where all the suspension components were going to mount and get the ride height correct and uh, the, the, the swing curves of the, the, the control arms and so on gave me decent camber uh, profiles and whatnot so that it would actually behave as I'd expect. Um, so I had to do some suspension modeling. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't find any usable open source software to do this. I could find things that would do one part of it, but then not everything else. Um, given that this is mostly basic maths and geometry and physics, um, it's not actually that hard to do. Um, I mean, I did a bunch of it in spreadsheets just because it's easy. Um, and so parts of it are I didn't need a tool for because I could just do them off the top of my head. Um, unfortunately, things like roll centers, uh, that's a little bit more complex and it's handy to have something that gives you a visualization of how the roll center moves as a wheel bumps in tra travels in bump and droop um, because that will tell you what the actual handling cap you know, characteristics of the car will be. Um, I ended up using a free and his beer uh, tool for that that's on the web and given this morning's keynote I don't longer feel quite so bad about that. Uh, but the thing is this is only static geometry, uh, it doesn't do kinematic analysis like the professional modeling tools do, um, so it's only, you know, people have done this for years but it's really only a ballpark guide to what the characteristics are going to be. It's not f as good as it could be. I might write a tool to do it, um, but at the moment I'm designing a race car and building a race car, not starting a new software project. Um, so one thing at a time. Car comes first, then new projects. So essentially the suspension design ends up with inboard shocks, uh, two to two and a half degrees of neck camber, um, a front roll center that's slightly lower than the rear roll center so when the car starts to roll it puts the load on the outside front tire which is the one that's doing all the turning. Uh, and it also inherited a bunch of anti-dive and anti-squat geometry that came from the donor car which was a Mazda RX-7. So, that's what the rear suspension actually is looking like at the moment. That was in my garage last week. Um, enough of the chassis has been welded together that I can actually mount all the suspension and measure the camber curves physically. Um, and I'm happy to say that where the model said that I, need, I should have had you know, minus two degrees of negative camber, I had minus 1.9. Um, so it's actually 
all working out quite well at this point and I haven't made any major mistakes. Fingers crossed. If I make a mistake at this point, then it's going to take a lot of work to actually fix it up. So I'm happy that these things are working properly. So with the suspension sorted out, I can now start to think about the next step. Um, we're going back to 3D CAD uh, to do some aerodynamic modelling. I have to design the body. Um, I have to make sure that it's going to actually work properly and not give me something that wants to shoot for the stars every time I put the, uh, the, my foot down. Um, I also need to know that it's going to cool correctly because um, there's nothing worse than overheating uh, an engine and having to throw away a $10,000 motor. Uh, that's not fun. Um, but to do all of this, I also needed to make the model more complex. It needs wheels, tyres, hubs, and, and so on. So the initial pass at bodywork kind of looked like this. I did everything as transparent overlay so that I could see the chassis underneath and work out where things would mount and how, what the clearances are against things like the radiators and intercoolers and whatnot. Um, so essentially what we're looking at here is that there's a, it's a flat floor design um, because that's most of the racing regs say that you have to have a flat floor. Uh, no ground effects are allowed, they're illegal because they're too effective. Um, and they don't like it when ground effects just break halfway through the corner because then you just go straight ahead and hit something. Uh, I've done that, don't want to do it again. Uh, yeah, so basically then a front splitter and, and possibly a wing uh, to generate front downforce and the diffuser at the back to generate rear downforce. Um, and use roughly the same size opening at the front for cooling because I know that worked on the last car. Yep, that's all right. So to do this, I needed to do CFD analysis. Um, and I had absolutely no clue how to do any of this. Um, Google wasn't much help. Uh, the learning curve is about that of standing at the bottom of the cliff and looking up. <laughs> very, very steep. Um, so one of the things I found searching around is that there was a lot of references to open foam and people using open foam because it was open. But then I worked out um, there's open foam and then there's open foam. There's about seven or eight different derivatives of it. It's been forked, it's been merged, it's been made into commercial products and so on. And so to make things simple, I just looked at it and said, which one does Debian package? Which happened to be openfoam.org, um, not openfoam.com. Don't get them mixed up. Uh, but the thing is, with all of these, the documentation assumed that the user had a deep knowledge of what they're actually trying to do. So um, it's difficult to understand what something does when the config files, and there's lots of them, uh, each option in a config file has a single line to describe what it does, and there's nothing else. So, you know. This field with this number, uh, default is minus 0 0.02, and it does something. That's a lot of the documentation is like that. It assumes you know what all these parameters are. Um, so it was quite difficult. Um, and some of the distro packaging didn't help. Uh, you get a whole bunch of tutorials and examples with OpenFoam. Um, but they assume that they're installed in the way that the upstream package installs them, and Debian installs them according to the Debian packaging rules. And so they don't run, they point to things that don't exist. Um, before I could run an example, I actually had to write my own helper files to actually execute everything. Um, so I had to work out how the whole thing worked before I could actually even get it to run a simple example. Um, got to hack things. It's difficult, but I did actually get it to, to, to work. So the CFD process is you basically define a flow region, a box. Um, it's got an inlet and outlet, it's got an upper and lower wall, and it's got side walls, and that's the area that it will work in. You take your 3D model and you place it somewhere in the flow, and then you turn the 3D space into a mesh of little cubes. Um, and you keep refining the mesh and dividing and subdividing and subdividing until all of the uh, features in your 3D model resolve correctly. Um, and that can 
take some time. Uh, you then run the, the uh, CFD calculation and you can visualize the results. So the big problem with this is that it's compute intensive. Um, sitting in my house is a server that's got 16p and 64 gig of RAM. Um, so I had a fair bit of power sitting there, but that still limited me to only about 12 million mesh cells. Um, that might sound like a lot, um, but that only allows me to resolve uh, down to about 10 millimetres. So when you have a radiator where the features you want to resolve are about two millimetres, um, you have to make some compromises to be able to actually model the behaviour. Um, and depending on how many cells on this machine I was building, it would take half an hour to two hours just to generate the mesh and then another half an hour to ten hours to do the actual computation. Um, the refinement really became limited by the cell count and actually being able to refine the parts of the model that I needed uh, was very complex to, to optimise. Um, but in the end, I started to find some useful output. Uh, coefficient of drag, uh, coefficient of lift, where the aerodynamic rotational centre of the, uh, the model actually is, uh, what, what, whether it's rotating forwards or rotating backwards. Um, so a typical Clubman has a coefficient of drag of uh, 0.65 to 0.75. Uh, the coefficient of drag of a brick uh, starts at about 0.8. So I'm designing for the aerodynamics of a brick here. And we all know you can make a brick fly if you've just got enough horsepower. <laughs> but still, uh, a couple of things that I've been looking for is that there's more front downforce than rear downforce um, and these numbers started to show me that yes I did actually have that. That's the yellow and orange lines. Um, there's slightly more front downforce than there is rear downforce which is what I want to design for. But that's just very rough numbers. Um, what I'm really interested in is the visualisation of the airflow. Uh, how is it moving over the car um, and where are the things that I need to optimise. So to do that, I've been using Paraview. Um, it's used for all sorts of scientific visualisations, atmospheric, stellar, um, you know, whether it be CFD, whether it be, you know, you could, I could have used it for visualising the finite element analysis. Um, so basically any sort of 3D data set you can, or any sort of data set really, you can visualise with Paraview. Um, it actually has a special parafoam mode which, in which it parses the output of open foam directly uh, and enables a bunch of things like making it easy to add streamlines um, and other functions that are typically used for CFD analysis. Um, and it can also create animations as well, which is kind of handy. So if you really want to see what's going on over time, you can just by telling it to create a video. So we end up with things like this. Uh, this is airflow underneath the bottom of the car. Um, the red section is high pressure, the green section is normal air pressure, and blue is low pressure. So there's high pressure in front of the car as it's pushing the brick through the air, uh, and there's low pressure under the front of the splitter, which is generating downforce. Uh, towards the back of the car, you can see the flow goes blue again, which means that the diffuser is also generating a low pressure, and that's where the rear downforce comes from. The flat bottom is there so that it doesn't disrupt the airflow underneath the car. And so you can see these things. And behind the car, you can see lots of wiggly wet spaghetti. Um, and they're draft eddies. So if you're optimising for no drag, you don't want to see any of them. If you're optimising for high downforce, uh, you want them to kind of get into really tight balls. So there's a, there's a few things there that just looking at these sorts of things can tell you. Um, but realistically, I wasn't sure whether these are good enough. So what do you do when you have a CFD problem and you don't think you've got enough resolution? Um, you need more compute. Uh, each mesh level of refinement roughly doubles the cell count um, and the refinement tends to affect the lift calculation more than the drag. Uh, 
So the highest refinement level I'd run so far is about 70 million cells. Um, and the numbers that we've come up with, oh, that required about 300 gigabytes of RAM to mesh. Um, so going up higher will just increase that even further. And so these are the, the comparison numbers. On the bottom, it's your right, I think, no, bottom left, um, is the drag numbers. And you can see that they don't change much over increasing refinement. Purple is the lowest uh, resolution. Uh, orange is the highest resolution. Uh, and so they're 0 0.8 to 0 0.75. Um, however, lift uh, 0.36 up to, you know, converging roughly at minus 2.5 for the lift coefficient. But what's important about these graphs is that they all show the same characteristics. Um, there's no change of behaviour of the simulation as the resolution increases. And that means that I can pretty much rely on the low resolution uh, simulations that I'm doing to give me a decent behavioural representation. Um, there's no surprises, just higher accuracy by increasing the, uh, the resolution. And so that allows me to do things like model the cooling flow. This is the front of the car and looking, you know, we're taking a cut straight down the middle of the car and we're looking at the airflow in through the radiator and intercooler. It comes in, the stuff that runs across the top of the splitter then goes up through the intercooler at the top and out the top of the bonnet. And what comes through uh, the bottom of the splitter uh, runs through this uh, pinky colour band, uh, runs through the radiator and out the bottom. Now, one of the things that happens when uh, you put airflow through a radiator is that it changes direction. And you can see that with the intercooler at the top. There's a 90 degree change of direction both on the inlet and the outlet. Uh, but that's not happening with the radiator because I haven't modelled the radiator correctly. That's what I can see from this. Uh, and so I refined the model. And now you can see that there's very different behaviour through the radiator. You can see that there's a 90 degree change of direction of the air. And we've got high speed air in front of the, uh, in front of the radiator and almost no flow velocity behind the radiator. Um, so that now tells me that the radiator is being modelled correctly and now I have an airflow problem because I've got to get low pressure behind the radiator so I get flow through it and everything works correctly. So that's the kind of thing that I'm doing there with that. So at this point, um, that's pretty much where I'm at at the moment in terms of design. I'm still refining the CFD model and whatnot and slowly getting it more and more accurate. Um, but overall, what I've found is that there's lots of individual tools that we have to deal with here. Um, they need to be combined in non-trivial ways um, and it's not particularly clear how you need to do that as an incoming user. Once you have the expertise, it's actually really good, but the learning curve is dramatic, uh, challenging, um, as is the documentation. Uh, everything requires some level of hacking to make it work, to make it useful. Um, and in having to do that, you realise that the consistency between all these different tools is non-existent. They all do things in different ways, and it may just be as simple as the user input. Every 3D program, every CAD program has a different mechanism for doing pan, tilt and zoom. And you're doing that all the time. And I might have three different th 3D programs up and I switch between them a couple of times a minute. And so I have to change my input method for pan, tilt and zoom three or four times a minute just because I'm using different programs. It's just little things like that that really start to make it challenging. Uh, and it's problems like this that you don't get with the professional engineering tools. Uh, they just work. If you need finite element analysis, it just works. You install the module, off you go. If you need CFD, you install the module, off you go. It's all integrated, it's all nice and neat. Um, you, so you can actually get there, but the question that I ask, can you design a race car with open source tools? I now understand why people are asking me, are you mad? Yes, you can do it, but at the moment with the quality of the tools and the integration between them, 
you'd have to be a little bit mad to do it. And on that note, thank you very much. So we don't really have any time for questions, unfortunately, as it's afternoon tea time, but thanks to Dave for talking about his mad project, and we'll be back in here at 3.40 for the closing and the lightning talks.